that we rarely talk about, particularly in church, and that's the issue in the subject of affairs. Affairs are one of those kind of subjects that, that we, we, we know it happens and we know that there are many people that are affected by it, but strangely and mysteriously, when we come to church, we just don't deal with it. It's, it's kind of like, you know, we know that there are a lot of people that come to church and pretend that they're coming because they're after God, but but they're really coming to see who they can just check out. We just don't talk about those kinds of things. But, but God has sent me here because we cannot close this series without unpacking and examining the anatomy of, of an affair. Because we can't deal with the rise and the fall of the family without broaching the subject of affairs because affairs are one of the biggest reasons why families fall. And, and not only historically have affairs led to the breakup and the destruction of families, but, but even more so contemporarily in this day and time. As a matter of fact, clinical psychologists now are saying that the number one reason that people come to them for counseling is because one of the individuals in the relationship has had an affair. And what's even more surprising is that more and more clinical psychologists are now saying that the individual that's had the affair is not the man, but it's the woman. Mm. This notion of, of married couples having affairs has become so in vogue, it's become so commonplace that, that not only are clinical psychologists seeing more and more broken families and broken marriages, but now the notion of an affair has become big business. There are multi-million dollar companies. There, there's one in particular, I'm not gonna uh, name any names because out of curiosity, I don't even want you to research the company, but, but, but the bottom line is there is a company that is a multi-million dollar company and the only thing that the company specializes in is facilitating and orchestrating affairs for married individuals. As a matter of fact, if you went out to their website, their slogan is, life is short, have an affair. Big business, but not only that, there is a popular cable television show that's about a male prostitute and his number one clients are married women. And, and I could talk about the company, I could talk about what clinical psychologists are reporting, I could talk about the cable television show, I could talk about the statistical data that's saying that close to about 50% of couples uh, in their relationship have had an affair. But, but even more poignantly, even more troubling, it is firsthand uh, the experience that I have week after week when I meet with couples that, that come to me because they're trying to figure out how to put their relationship back together if possible because one of them has had an affair. I, I meet with couples and I met with many of them and, and continue to do so. They, they come to me and say, Pass, I want to meet with you and their relationship is hanging on by thread. Their, their marriage, their family is literally skating on thin ice because one of them has had an affair. I, I've, I, I've met with, with numerous individuals whose self-esteem and, and confidence in the possibility of a successful relationship is at an all-time low because the one they gave their heart to, the one that they gave their, their, their all to, had the audacity to have an affair. I, I've met with people who, who don't even know if they will ever get back to the place where they can really trust an individual uh, in a relationship again because at one time they trusted somebody. They were completely vulnerable to someone and that person had the audacity to have an affair. And with all of the different couples that I met with, with all of the different individuals that have had affairs that, that have come to me, they all say the exact same thing. It all starts off like this. Past, I really didn't mean to, it just happened. You got to understand, Pastor, I really didn't mean to. It just happened. And, you know, I believe, I really do believe that they didn't mean to. I don't think that anybody wakes up one day and says, you know, I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm going to go to Krispy Kreme and grab a donut. And I just, I think I'll have an affair today. I don't, 
I, I, don't, I don't think anybody just wakes up and says, oh, you know, I've been okay for a while, but I don't think it's time for me to have an affair. So I, I, I believe it when they say pass, pass. I didn't mean to, but at the same time, I know that an affair does not just happen. Hey, they say pass. I just, it just happened. It just one day, it just happened. No, affairs do not just happen. There are several systematic steps that lead to an affair. As a matter of fact, by the time there is physical intimacy in an affair, that affair is full grown. Which means that the affair was born some time ago in the past. And what you've been doing is you've been doing little things to nurture and to develop the affair from a baby to a full grown adult. This is why James chapter 1 and in verse 15 it says, After desire has conceived. It gives birth to sin, and when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. So, so God sent us here today to examine the anatomy of an affair. I know this has been a different series, and I know that perhaps uh, you've been a part of ministries that have never dealt with this subject, but you have to understand what an affair is made of. You have to understand what contributes to an affair because the way you deal with an affair, the way that you position your marriage and position your relationships in such a way that they are affair proof is that you don't wait and deal with an affair when it's full grown. You understand it so that you can order your life in such a way that you never give birth to it. And as I'm surveying this facility... I'm looking out and I know that some of you are saying, well, past, maybe this is not my word because, because my relationship, my marriage is great. I've never had a, a situation where I've had to deal with my spouse cheating on me. I, I've never, in fact, cheated on my spouse. And so, and so maybe this is not my word. Hold on before you mentally check out. Hold, well, just wait a second before you, you pick up your, 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 your phone to start playing games. Just wait a second. Hold on because what you need to understand are that the steps that lead to a physical affair are the exact same steps that lead to a spiritual affair. And so maybe, maybe your spouse has never cheated on you. Maybe you've never cheated on your spouse. Maybe you're not even married. Maybe you're divorced and maybe you're no longer dealing with, with cheating spouses and cheating individuals. But the question is, have you cheated on God? Mm. As a matter of fact, that's something you ought to be Twittering about right now. That, that's a good question to put on Facebook. Have, have you ever cheated on God? This is why Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, this is why it says what it says. We've looked at this passage a couple of different times throughout this series. Ephesians 5 and 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then later on, it also goes on to say, And wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. The latter portion of Ephesians chapter 5 deals with marriage. How a husband is supposed to love his wife, how a wife is supposed to love her husband. But then in the very last Last verse of Ephesians 5, right around verse 32, Paul says something that's startling. He says, this is a profound mystery, and I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul, Paul says, in other words, see, you just thought when you were reading Ephesians 5 that I was just talking about a husband loving his wife and a wife loving her husband. He says, no, 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 but it's deeper than that. He says, in other words, your physical marriage relationship is supposed to be a reflection. It's supposed to be an example of your love relationship between you and the Lord. He says, I'm not just talking about human marriage. I'm talking about a mystery. I'm talking about the relationship between you, the church, and God. Christ. See, this is why this is not just a word for individuals that are going through a difficult time in their marriage. You don't even have to be married to understand that if you are not in a physical marriage, if you have given your life to Christ, you are in a spiritual marriage because when you said, I give my life to you, you became married to our Savior. This is why Paul even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, hold on single, slow your roll. Don't be in such a rush to get married. He says, because when you're not married, you have more time to devote to your first marriage, which is between you and God. You have to understand that, that, that if you never have a physical affair, you can certainly have a spiritual one. 
This is why when God sends the prophet Jeremiah to the children of Israel and he puts this prophetic word in the mouth of Jeremiah to tell them that they're getting ready to go through a difficult period of time, God sends Jeremiah to prophesy that the 